Coming up next, CityNet 30 takes you downtown for the weekly luncheon meeting of the City Club of Portland. Live weekly coverage of City Club is made possible in part by TCI and is produced through the facilities of Portland Cable Access. Now we join the City Club for this week's program. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm Francis Storrs, president of the City Club of Portland. <clears throat> I want to welcome you to another outstanding program. And I want to also welcome our live television audience on CityNet 30. Today, we focus on one of Oregon's fastest growing businesses, the business of gambling. Our panel of four experts, Peter Bragdon, Chris Lyons, Bruce Thomas, and Ellen Lowe, will share their unique perspectives on the industry and what it means for the state. Uh, an announcement to remind you that next Friday, March 13th, we will take a look at the relationship of Northwesterners to the land on which they live. Tim Egan, correspondent for the New York Times, will explore with us the frenzied bounty and frenzied exploitation of the Pacific Northwest and the effects of its politics on the natural environment we call home. And we'll be here again at the Multnomah Club. Please note in this week's bulletin that the club's 1998 nominating committee has begun its work. Members of the committee are Susan Deskamp, Peter Heuser, Jay Formick, Stephen Schneider, Carol Stone, and Hillary Barber, and Andrew Wheeler. If you have suggestions, please forward them to the committee chair, Susan Deskamp, or obviously to any of these committee members that you know, or to executive director Nancy Hedin at the club office. Our board host today is Doug Marker, Senior Policy Coordinator for Northwest Power Planning Council and member of the Board of Governors of the City Club, where he serves as Chair of the Issues Committee. We will ask the he will ask the first question of our speakers. And following Doug's question, uh, we will open the program to members of uh, City Club who are in the audience. Please line up right here behind the microphone while Doug is asking his question so that we can get as many questions asked as possible uh, of our uh, panelists today. Do limit your questions to 30 seconds. Broadcast of City Club programs this quarter is made possible in part because of corporate underwriting from Fred Meyer, Washington Mutual Savings Bank, and Stoll Reeves, and we are grateful indeed for their support. <laughs> and now to our program <clears throat> and gambling in Oregon will be discussed by our panelists, Peter and Chris, Bruce and Ellen. And I want to introduce them all to you before they begin to speak. They will speak in the order that you see them displayed here in front of you. Uh, Peter Bragdon is an attorney with Stoll Reeves, where his corporate practice focuses on securities, finance, transactions, and emerging companies. Kind of a practice, you might say, concerned with gambling. <clears throat> Peter has served as an Assistant Attorney General for Oregon to assist with the Governor's Task Force examining the state gambling policy. He has editorialized on gambling in the New York Times, and his Amherst political science background and his law backgrounds at Stanford and Yale have assisted him in writing books and articles concerned with American politics. He will be our first speaker today and attempt to put the gambling issue in perspective for us. Chris Lyons will come next. She is the director of the Oregon State Lottery and she <coughs> um, has been at the State Lottery for uh, since 1986, is that right, Chris? No. You correct when you come up. And uh, this, uh, since she's been here, the lottery has become the source of 10% of the state's total budget. Before she assumed her responsibility for the 350 state lottery employees, she was administrator for the Oregon Liquor Control Commission and also previously was an owner of clothing stores. Her special interest concerns improving communication between government and its constituents. 
Bruce Thomas is the president and CEO of Spirit Mountain Gaming Incorporation. He is a member of the Confederate Tribes of the Grand Ronde, Commission, uh, Grand Ronde Community. And as a member of the Oregon State Bar, he was formerly a Stoll Reeves partner. Since 1993, he has spent his time developing Spirit Mountain Casino and other tribal businesses to enable the Grand Ronde tribe to achieve economic independence. He too has served on the governor's task force on gaming. Ellen Lowe, our final speaker, has served as public policy director for the Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon since 1986. Ecumenical Ministries joins 16 Christian denominations to unite in um, developing community uh, uh, activities that focus around public policy advocacy uh, and religious dialogue and education. She too served on the Governor's Gaming Task Force and on the board uh, of the Gaming um, Addiction Foundation of Oregon. She chaired Ecumenical Ministries 1984 effort to feed the state lottery initiative. The players are definitely all here. My only regret is that we don't have all day to work with them. Let's start with Peter Bragdon's overview. Welcome, Peter. Well, thank you. I wanted to give you my perspective on the gambling that we have in Oregon and how I think the gambling market developed and where, where we may be going. And I want to start by making a couple of observations that may say something about where we're going with this. And the first is that most of the people that I know in this state are in favor of legalized gambling. They think it's a good thing. And most of the people I know think, also think that gambling is a bad thing. And what does this tell you? I, it, either I know a lot of confused people, or I think it tells you about a major impact of the growth of gambling in this state. And I think as a result of the growth, there are many more different groups in the state with, an, with a stake in the gambling market. And there are just many more issues involved in any gambling debate now, including uh, hot button issues such as taxation, uh, morality, race. What I find is many people end up on both sides of a debate about whether gambling is good or bad, depending on what, what it is that we're talking about. And some people think that gambling is only good when it's conducted by the state, by a lottery, therefore reducing our taxes and funding our programs. And a lot of other people think that's the only time that it's objectionable, when the state's in the business of getting uh, citizens to bet and lose their money. Some people approve of gambling only when it's conducted by Indian tribes, because it's been shown to be really one of the most effective means of providing economic self-sufficiency. But for a lot of other people, that's when it's objectionable, when tribes are able to operate casinos and others can't. Now, some people disapprove of gambling generally, but then as an aside, they'll say that they like to go to the horse and dog tracks and that's not really gambling, that's agriculture. <laughs> and I've also encountered a lot of people who say that gambling is bad, but they don't mind going to a bingo game and supporting charitable causes. So my point is that uh, gambling debates in the 1990s, because of all this growth that we've had, have become much more complicated than they were 20 years ago. And I think it's made it very difficult for politicians to do anything uh, about this topic. Well, that, that said, let me step back and give you a sense of my view of uh, how I think we got into this complicated situation. And the explosion of gambling in the state really started in 1984 when we approved the lottery. And in my view, for the most part, this is, the expansion has not been the result of a gambling policy that was intended to spread legalized gambling. It's really been uh, the byproduct of state budget policy. And I want to start by talking about the lottery because the lottery is by far the dominant player in Oregon's market. It may not be the one you always hear about, but it, it uh, has about two-thirds of the market, I think. And um, also the lottery is really where you see the impact of uh, budget politics in the state. And the story of the lottery is really one of steady expansion to meet state revenue needs. And as we have uh, uh, started to rely more on lottery revenues, particularly to fund vital programs, our lottery uh, became one of the most ambitious in the country. We started with traditional games, scratch tickets and drawings back in 1985. In 1989, we became the only state in the country that had a lottery sports wagering game, and we're the only state that has that now. 1991, we became one of a handful of states that offered Keno, 
which has traditionally been more of a casino style game. And in 1992, we added video poker, which, and we're one of just a handful of states that has that. So that by 1995, Oregon had become number six in the world for per capita lottery wagering. And while that number is shocking to some people, our goal was to become number one. And uh, we know that in the last budget cycle, the lottery earnings equaled about 9% of the state uh, general fund budget. The percentage has gone down, but lottery revenues have actually gone up. It's just our budget is getting bigger. Um, and in this video poker, the importance of it, uh, video poker just can't be overstated. It's a very fast and lucrative game for the owner. And uh, we're unlike the, the drawings and scratch tickets, which people could play every so often, um, video poker machines can play about 500 games in an hour if a player is experienced. And to give a sense of the revenue power of video poker, uh, consider that it was introduced in 1992. By 1996-97, uh, revenues after prizes had risen to about $393 million, and now it accounts for three quarters of lottery revenues. And even though it was the last game introduced uh, by the, uh, in the lottery, the last major game, we've raised more with video poker than with all of the other games combined. And video poker revenues are expected to continue rising, although that's starting to flatten out. They're going to continuing to go up. Well, I think the state's reliance on gambling money helps to explain the expansion of the lottery. And when you rely on gambling as a major source of funding, it creates a political environment where there's steady pressure to maintain and increase uh, gambling opportunities. And I don't mean to say that legislators are going to Chris's office and saying, well, you must raise this much money because that's what we want to spend. But it's the general political environment that's created. And think, think about this. When the state approved lottery bonds to fund education, it was not just a commitment to fund education. It's also at the same time a commitment to operate the lottery. As we saw a great example of the political pressure in 1995 when suddenly it, appears that it appeared that lottery revenues were going to fall short of the forecast. And what had happened is the legislature had already committed <laughs> all of the funds that were expected to be raised with that forecast. Uh, by the lottery. So, lot uh, so uh, legislators were suddenly in this awkward position of either having to cut spending or find ways of increasing gambling revenues. And not surprisingly, what you saw was a number of legislators thinking that it would be a pretty good idea for the state to add electronic slot machines. And that's when Brady Adams, the state Senate president, uh, started uh, <coughs> touting that. Well, I think that explains the lottery. And I, I want to talk for a minute about another piece, which is the Indian gambling, because they're related. And I think uh, budget policy helps to explain that as well. It's, it's a complicated story, but let me just try and sum it up. Uh, the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act, which was passed by Congress in 1988, generally permits federally recognized Indian tribes to offer, in a cas offer casino style games that the state otherwise allows by law. So when you put that together with the fact that Oregon has more forms of legalized gambling than most other states, you can see the opportunities that were here in this state for tribes. We have horse and dog racing. And the fact that we allow that permits the tribes to offer gambling on those events. We have social gambling, which is the card games such as blackjack in taverns and bars around the state. And that permits and creates the opportunity for tribes to offer blackjack. We have charity casino nights, or also known as Happy Canyon Days, because for the event that happens in Pendleton. And that offers up a whole range of gambling activities, such as roulette. Uh, we have bingo, and then, as I said, we have the lottery. And of all of these different types of gambling, it's really the lottery that created the most opportunities for the tribes. Those are the most lucrative games. So at this point, we have seven of nine federally recognized tribes in the state that have opened gaming centers. And it really should not have surprised anybody. I think a number of people were, were surprised, by it, but it shouldn't have. The federal, the federal rights that permit tribes to have gaming establishments were well known as we expanded the lottery. And when we authorized all of the new games for the lottery, we were essentially authorizing uh, the tribes to have all of these games, and we knew it. Let me mention one other factor that I think has been at work uh, in the politics of the state, and that's that the growth itself created a dynamic that enhances pressure for more gambling. And that's the political pressure related to this level playing field syndrome, where now we have a politically competitive market possibly an economically competitive market, and all these different segments of the gambling market started coming to Salem saying, we need one measure or another in order to be able to compete with some other segment of the market. 
So we had the horse and dog tracks in Portland coming to Salem asking to add hundreds of video gambling devices at the tracks. Initially that was to be able to compete with the lottery and then they came back and uh, sought to have that again in order to be able to compete with the tribes and they were unsuccessful. The lottery and its retailers started asking for more games and including electronic slot machines is the most notable one in order to be able to compete with tribes and bingo operators came and started asking for higher prize limits and so the talk in Salem was of an arms race in gambling where there'd be no, spa no place to really logically draw the line on gambling expansion. And I think it was in the midst of this in the mid-1990s that we started to realize that budget policy really wasn't, was not an adequate substitute for gambling policy. And there was a realization that by focusing so much on revenues and the revenues we could generate for the state, the state had expanded this gambling market without taking into account a number of other issues that went with that expansion. We'd never seriously studied as a state any of the social or economic impacts of gambling, either good or bad and we much less weighed those factors in our public policy making. And the state had heard stories about gambling addiction and about individuals who had literally lost hundreds of thousands of dollars in uh, playing state games such as video poker. But no basic addiction study had ever been done in the state. We knew of individuals who had committed crimes or gone bankrupt in order to play state lottery games, but no one had ever even tried to quantify that uh, or the impact that it had on families or on employers or on other parts of the community. And as I said, we'd heard all these different stories about competition, but there had been no serious statistical study showing the impact of one form of gambling on the other. In fact, as all these different groups were complaining about losing to one of the other groups, what we really saw was the entire gambling market growing with more people wagering more money. Well, the governor's task force in 1996 couldn't answer most of these questions, but I think the fact that the task force raised them and helped the state to start to recognize what it doesn't know about gambling and what it should know about gambling helped to slow the expansion somewhat. Back in 1995 when we were first getting started the pressure to add electronic slot machines was really overwhelming and by 1996 it seemed clear to me that we were going to have electronic slot machines for the lottery. But by 1997 what we saw was a number of policymakers, most notably the governor, asking the lottery not to add these games, not to add electronic slot machines until the state had done more to both understand addiction and to do something to address addiction problems. And he also wanted to wait for the state government to start to address its own addiction to gambling revenues. And separately, at the same time, the governor began to renegotiate compacts or agreements with the, state tri uh, with the tribes in the state, asking them each to operate only one casino in their existing uh, mostly rural locations. And that was a, that's a concession that he's asked from the tribes because there's nothing in federal law that would limit that. But a number of people, have, have, you've probably read about that in the paper with these new <coughs> deals in which a number of tribes, including the Grand Run, have agreed to just stick with one location. Well, to me right now, it's not really clear how far we're going to go to try and understand gambling in the state. And I think we're a long way from being able to answer the question that's in the city club invitation. Are we creating a monster? by expanding gambling here. But in my view, uh, in one respect, we have created a monster. And the monster is not gambling itself. I don't think we know the answer to that. It's a budget policy that relies so heavily on gambling that what we face is constant pressure to expand even before we understand the impact that that expansion has on the state. Thank you. Thank you. I really do appreciate this opportunity to uh, speak to the City Club today and really I'm looking forward to an opportunity to answer questions. I do a lot better with questions than I do with prepared remarks, so bear with me. I wanted to spend my 10 minutes uh, really giving you an overview of the lottery <clears throat> and uh, the framework and then we'll get to individual questions a little later. As most of you know, the lottery was created through the initiative process in 1984 by a two to one margin, the citizens approved a constitutional amendment to establish the lottery. At the same time, the citizens voted for a set of statutes that dictated how the lottery was to operate. First and foremost, it's the job of the lottery and my job as director to administer the constitutional and statutory mandate of the citizens. 
The statutes say that the purpose of the lottery is to maximize revenue commensurate with the public good. Throughout the law, we are told to ensure and maintain the fairness, the integrity, and the security of the games. The Lottery Commission contracts with the state police to do background investigations on vendors, uh, on our retailers, and on our staff. The Secretary of State's office conducts financial audits of our books, and we rely he heavily on the Attorney General's office for legal advice. The Lottery Commissioners and I serve at the pleasure of the Governor, and we are confirmed by the full Senate. In the law, when the citizens passed the statutes, <clears throat> uh, they dictated that 84 percent of the money that was made from the sale of tickets was to be given back to the public in the form of either prizes or earnings. Right now we return about 94 percent of the sales back to the citizens in one form or another. By law, at least 50 percent or half of the sales must be returned back to the players in the form of prizes. Currently, we pay out on average about 62 uh, percent in prizes. By law, our administrative expenses can't exceed 16 percent of sales. Those expenses cover things like our retailer commissions, our vendor fees, and, and uh, lottery expenses like payroll and advertising. Our expenses run about 6 percent of sales. The rest is turned over to the state for education and economic development programs. The lottery operates as a self-supporting, revenue-raising agency of state government. That's what the people of Oregon wanted. The people who are financing the lottery are the players who play the games. As Peter indicated, uh, we first introduced scratch tickets. Eventually, the agency added games like Megabucks, Powerball, and Keno. In 1989, the legislature added sports action and dedicated those profits for college athletics and scholarships. Sports action has raised about $17 million for these programs. Our traditional products, the ones I've just described, raise about $70 million a year in revenue for education and economic development. In 1991, the legislature turned over the management and regulation of video poker to the lottery. As a matter of fact, the uh, Attorney General and the Superintendent of State Police at the time testifi testified before the legislature <clears throat> on this and supported and recommended this idea. I think the uh, Police Chiefs Association were one of the sponsors of that legislation. Bringing video poker under state control and regulation was seen as the most effective way to eliminate widespread illegal gambling. At that time, there were about 10,000 illegal video slot and video poker machines in bars and taverns around the state. Secondarily, legalizing uh, video uh, games was a way to raise much needed revenue after the passage of property tax limitations. The lottery accomplished both those public policy goals. The illegal gray machines are gone. The games are now well regulated and operated fairly and honestly. The lottery does raise about $230 million a year for education and economic development from these games. The vast majority <coughs> of Oregonians support the lottery. The lottery basically exists because the citizens of Oregon want it to be here. That high level of support has frankly continued throughout its history. I don't really find that particularly surprising. The people who play the games see it as fun and entertaining and a way to raise money for good causes. Um, quite a few people who don't play see it as a way to raise money without raising their own personal taxes. A recent survey found that about 80 percent of adult Oregonians have gambled in their lifetime. That same survey said that 70 percent of Oregonians gambled last year. Uh, gambling is perceived by the majority of folks as a widely accepted form of entertainment. Surveys show that between 60 and 70 percent of Oregonians would vote to retain the lottery, including video poker. 
As Peter indicated in, in 1995, voters added education to the list of programs to be financed by the lottery. It received 90 percent voter approval. Last year, 75 percent of voters backed, <clears throat> approved backing school bonds with lottery proceeds. Obviously, some policymakers and some Oregonians do not support the lottery. Opinions about gambling are often aligned with a people's personal values. Some people find it difficult to understand the government's involvement in it. Frankly, our mandate is to carry out the will of the people and to administer the laws and the rules that reflect it. I'd like to t just to mention a little bit about the player. The typical player is really a typical Oregonian. Income, education, and age levels nearly match the population in each category. On average, men and women play equally. They have uh, a high school education, some college, and a household income that averages uh, $35,000 a year. It's a common myth, but a myth nonetheless, that the lottery preys on the poor and uneducated. Unfortunately, there are about 3.3 percent of Oregonians that may be classified as problem gamblers. This rate is about average among all other states examined, despite the fact that Oregon has more forms of gambling uh, than any state in the nation. In a recent study by Dr. Rachel Volberg, and this study came as a result of much of the work from the Governor's Task Force, she found that 1.9 percent are problem gambler, gamblers and 1.4 percent are pathological gamblers. Dr. Volberg, in her communications to the Lottery Commission and to the Addiction Treatment Foundation, has indicated that Oregon is doing a pretty good job managing gambling. She attributes the relatively low prevalency rates to the way the state has regulated gambling and because of the quality of treatment here. One of the things the lottery has done over the years is to place limits on the bets and the top prize and the state provides treatment for, has provided treatment for uh, problem gamblers since a video began. The policy framework for the lottery is a reflection of one of the most basic premises of state government. Carry out the mandate of the majority while providing for the needs of the minority. As I mentioned earlier, the law clearly states that one of the basic purposes of the lottery is to raise revenue for economic development and education. And at the time, it was written that they really wanted to do that in lieu of a new or increased taxes. Since 1985, the lottery has raised over $1.6 billion for state programs. The governor and the legislature decide where, what the money is to be spent on. Originally, uh, because of the economic times, about 85 percent of the funds raised focused on uh, economic development and jobs, and only about 15 percent on education. As times have changed and because of the property tax issues, that is really reversed. About 85 percent of the money that the lottery raises goes to edu education programs and about 15 percent to economic development. Since 1985, the lottery has paid out over $3.7 billion in prizes. And lastly, the lottery has paid nearly $1 billion to Oregon businesses for different services and supplies. The lottery is a public agency running a gambling business. That makes some people very uncomfortable. We've been given the job by the people of maximizing revenue commensurate with the public good. We understand both our revenue raising and our regulatory responsibilities. We understand that while most people, about 97 percent, can play responsibly, about 3 percent of the population have a gambling problem. We understand that when huge sums of money are at stake, we must be vigilant <coughs> against crime and corruption. We have an often complex and controversial set of responsibilities, and we take a balanced and thoughtful approach to our job. We work very closely uh, with the governor and the legislature and have been working with the governor to establish the policy framework within which the lottery is to operate. I'll be glad to uh, answer questions uh, uh, during the later portion of the program. Thank you.
Good afternoon. I'd like to uh, thank you for giving me a chance to tell the tribe's story today. Um, and I think to tell the story, I really like to tell you who the tribe is because it's an important part of it. Uh, the Confederated Tribes of Grand Rod is comprised of five different tribes, and it was the people that lived primarily in the Willamette Valley, uh, south to the uh, northern California. It includes tribes of the Kalapuya, the Malala, the uh, Umpqua, the Rogue River, and the Shasta. In 1855, um, there was a, a roundup of tribes in the winter of 1855, starting in southern Oregon with the Rogue River and Shasta tribes. And uh, the military brought on the way up north toward Grand Ronde, collected the rest of the tribes on the way, and all of the tribes were put together at the Grand Ronde Reservation. Over the next period of time, uh, various federal acts and so forth caused the tribes reservation, which was 69,000 acres originally, to decline to the point where in the early 50s it was six acres and it was the tribal cemetery. The tribe was terminated from federal recognition in 1954 and a lot of the tribal members were given one-way bus tickets under the Relocation Act, it was called, uh, to major cities on the west coast, so that um, probably two-thirds of the tribal members left the area but a third stayed, and from 1954 until the late 70s, uh, remained active. My family uh, stayed there. We'd, we would go back for powwows and other things, informal gatherings of tribal members. Um, in the late 70s, some of the people who stayed behind got together and started an effort to gain restoration of the tribe. And in 1984, the tribe was restored to federal recognition. A 1990 study sort of took stock of where the tribal members were at that time. And what we found was that um, unemployment levels ranged somewhere between 17 and 40 percent. Um, tribal members as a whole had lower education levels, uh, poverty level. Uh, the average tribal income was $5,000 under average income, which is not a high figure to begin with. And then there were higher levels of sort of poverty-related conditions, alcoholism, which has been a traditional problem that's plagued tribes and other problems. After the tribe was restored, it looked at ways to obtain revenue to address some of these problems. Uh, the tribe obtained a reservation in 1988, which created some timber revenue, which was helpful, and formed a, an economic development corporation in the early 90s. And I uh, agreed to serve on that, uh, on that organization. What we found is it was easy to identify the needs for economic development because the tribe is not able to assess taxes or raise money in other ways that other governments are able to do. Um, so we tried to look at how could we start businesses to generate revenue. The, the problem was uh, Grand Ronde is remote. The tribe had very little capital. Those of you who are in business can kind of check off the things you need to start a business and we really didn't have any of those things. But some of the tribal leaders went to visit a tribe in the, on the East Coast that did, was successful. It was re reorganized about the same time as our tribe and it had business ventures and had advanced farther than we had. And what they found is that they were able to have the other business ventures because they had a bingo hall that generated capital that they were able to invest in other businesses. It also generated jobs. Up to that point, and this was like 1992, uh, we never considered gambling as a revenue source. We didn't know anything about it. Um, Another tribe in Oregon had done it, but it was a small enterprise, didn't create a lot of jobs, didn't have a profound impact. But then we found out that with our location, many of you maybe don't know, we're on the way to the beach out of, kind of, out of Salem. We're within um, 75 miles of two and a half million people. So it became apparent quickly that that was a huge opportunity. When we were setting the corporation up, the, our goal was two parts. And the primary goal was to generate revenue for tribal programs. The secondary goal was to create jobs. Um, the programs that the tribe targeted for the revenue was education, health care, housing, and other economic development so that we could diversify, similar to what the other tribe had done. Um, we built the casino. We did it on our own. We were able to obtain conventional financing. We were able to form our own management team and build it and operate it ourselves. Uh, it has surpassed our uh, original uh, pr projections and uh, really pretty much our wildest dreams. We, we have 1,300 employees at the casino right now. Uh, the revenue from the casino has allowed the tribe to provide health insurance to all tribal members. It has allowed us to provide a pension benefit to tribal elders, scholarships for tribal youth. We've built a housing pro project. 
uh, state-of-the-art health clinic, and we have used the proceeds to develop other businesses. Starting small at first, we're pretty conservative in our approach. Um, the revenue has also allowed us to expand the tribe's existing tradition of sharing with the outside community. When our tribal chairwoman went to Washington, D.C. to lobby for restoration of the tribe, she made the commitment that if, we, if the federal government would help us to become restored, then we would share with the surrounding community. And Willamina shared in communities were in pretty desperate straits with the uh, collapse of the timber industry. Um, in the co last compact we signed with the governor, we agreed to provide 6% of our net revenue to a charitable foundation. We have been hugely successful. Um, the first year we have spent over $1.8 million through that fund on things like OMSI, the Portland Art Museum, Life Flight, and on compulsive gambling programs. We started that effort actually before we ever built the casino. We got together with the groups that addressed those problems and tried to find out what role could we play. How could we help to minimize the, the problem? Um, over time, we, we paid for the prevalence study. Um, we've paid for a study on youth gambling. Um, we've provided for financing for counselors and other things. We, we've taken an approach of working with the individual agencies and trying to find out what their needs are and address them directly. Um, based on our revenue in 1997, we, the fund that we created will uh, have more than $2.4 million next year. Um, and I guess in closing, uh, before we go to the questions, I, with any issue, there are positives and there are negatives. And what we've tried to do is maximize the positives for the tribe and the surrounding community and minimize the negatives. And I think we've, we're happy and, and proud of the job we've done in doing that. Thank you very much. I should begin with a disclaimer because an expert on gambling I am not. Um, the longest I've been in the presence of a video poker machine was when the gaming task force went to Spirit Mountain and um, I had to listen to that what to me was a disturbing noise for hours. Um, the Kino machine at the grocery store is still a mystery to me but my knowledge level of the impact of gambling, particularly video lottery, increases daily. And it reinforces my continued belief in a statement I made in 1984 on behalf of Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon. And that was that state-sponsored gambling is morally, ethically, and economically wrong for Oregon. Oh, how I wish we had been wrong. Now, my, while my preference would be to have the positions they hold non-existent, I do want to express my utmost respect and admiration for Chris Lyons and Bruce Thomas. For Chris really has brought professionalism and balance to the operation of the lottery. The statutory mandate to maximize revenues commensurate with the public good is being heeded. The public good, I believe, was ignored for too long. Bruce has brought supportive services, jobs, and perhaps more importantly, hope to the Grand Ronde. I believe him when he describes Spirit Mountain as a means to an end. The economic diversity is beginning and the integrity is there. Now because Chris and Bruce are so capable, I have no sense of guilt for wanting their jobs to disappear <laughs> because both the private and the public sectors will continue to welcome their skills, I'm sure. I'd like to briefly reflect on that 1984 election that brought us the lottery. Remember, we were in a recession. The commitment was to economic development. And besides, there were historians all over the place that um, assured us that lotteries were cyclical. So shouldn't we relax? It would just go away. Our vigilance leveled off along with lottery interest and that's when video poker arrived at the legislature. 
Multnomah County and the city of Portland appeared to be the only local jurisdictions enforcing the ban on gray games. And the legislature chose to solve the law enforcement problem of the other 35 counties by substituting legal, state-operated ones for the illegal ones, rather than looking to what Multnomah County had done. Now, in addition to the lobbies of those 35 sheriffs, the lobby also included everyone who was promised revenue from the ports up and down the coast in the Columbia to the board of OMSI. Some very worthy ends justified the means and statements about the morality of the issues were summarily dismissed. Our arguments suggested that gambling encourages a form of idolatry, really a worship of luck and wealth. It was contrary to our faith community's work ethic. We also said that discretionary income would be diverted from the local stores and investments to machines. Legislators doubted our prophetic voice, and video poker became law by one Senate vote. One of the victories was limiting the, the uh, video poker machines to five per establishments. And you know, I've often wondered if we had lost that argument, and they actually had approved 10 or 15 maybe the um, lawsuit that Ecumenical Ministries filed would have, um, we would have prevailed because then perhaps the courts really would have said that we did have casinos in Oregon. Now, two of our predictions during the video poker debate have come to pass. The growing addiction of the state to gambling revenues and the increasing addiction of its citizens to machine gambling. Lottery revenues have cushioned the negative impact of Measure 5 and its progeny on local and state services. What is now approaching 10% of the general fund has allowed the legislature and us, the voters, to avoid restructuring Oregon's tax system to meet the tests of adequacy, ability to pay, fairness, efficiency, competitiveness, flexibility, consumer responsibility, the criteria that I know has been part of your studies at the City Club and it's part of our social principles at Ecumenical Ministries. At the beginning of the last session, there were legislative leaders who spoke of adding line games to meet budget needs. And I'm sure that their primary motive was not to entertain you. Now, fortunately, line games were not added, and the lottery, followed, lottery commission followed suit. But reflect for a moment on the opportunity loss to breathe fairness into our tax system. Instead, our state addiction and dependency continues to grow. Whenever I hear the hospitality industry seeking additional machines or new games in the name of leveling the playing field, I think of what will make up the fill to accomplish that leveling. It reads like the human misery index, bankruptcies, embezzlements, abuse, crime, divorce, suicides, the list is long. The criminal indiscretions of public employees and elected officials are a matter of public record and therefore public notice and even headlines. But they are the tip of the iceberg of others who are feeding their gambling addiction at the expense of their families and their jobs. I should note that the criminal behavior to acquire funds, gambling funds, is generally a first-time offense. Pathological gamblers rarely have criminal histories. The Volberg Report to the Gambling Addiction Treatment Foundation, which, by the way, does include all three of us who are involved in this, um, 
estimates that 18,900 Oregonians currently suffer from pathological gambling and need immediate treatment. The problem gamblers, then you get up to 78,000, but the pathological ones, these are folks who need treatment now. But for that to happen, additional resources are needed. Treatment programs in Portland and Eugene are now at capacity and we're going to have to have waiting lists. The Oregon Lottery's advertising campaign to get problem gamblers into treatment is working. And I applaud Chris for the quality of the ads that they are doing and the work they're doing with problem gamblers. Calls to the gambling hotline have increased 44% in the last six months. Over 2,100 people have been in treatment. Follow-up studies show that about 60% remain abstinent from gambling one year after completing treatment. Treatment does work. Compare that with the statistics in the A&D field. Most of the problem gamblers in treatment are there because of video poker. 80% of the clients report that video poker is their preferred gambling activity. Now, Governor Kitzhopper has called for increased funding to treat gambling addiction. And he said that he might go to the emergency board soon for an increase in addiction treatment funding. And I hope you will join me in supporting the governor's efforts. For if the legislature and the emergency board can find money to support the gambling industry, as they did last fall by appropriating an increase of over $1 million for horse racing, they certainly should be able to provide the additional $400,000 needed for Oregon families victimized by gambling addiction. I should note that the legislature has maintained a modest but continuing commitment to funding addiction treatment, even when the court, in our case, nullified the original source of dollars. And if you join in the asking, I'm sure they will approve the additional dollars at the emergency board. You know, if we fear the answer, we often avoid asking the questions. And that certainly was the case regarding the lottery until Governor Kitzhopper appointed the task force on gaming, se selecting Ted Kulongowski as chair, and brilliantly arranging for Peter Bragdon and his staff. And Stoll Reeves, um, what a marvelous gift they gave to the state. I have a feeling that Peter would like to see this issue go away. And I hope that all of us can make it go away sometime by doing away with the lottery. But Peter was exceptional as our staff person. This task force really started a series of questions which led to the prevalence study that has been mentioned. The first youth study is underway. It's also led to the lottery enforcing dominant use, dominant purpose. They may have to start serving food at Dottie's Delis. Um, the, um, the, Lottery is also doing exceptional outreach to problem gamblers. But additional outside inquiry, a continuing critique from the community is needed, particularly as it relates to the net socioeconomic costs of state-sponsored gambling. Now, I'm confident that you and the Portland City Club have all reserved the right to be wiser tomorrow. So with these new directions of the lottery, the foundation reports as a frame of reference. May I suggest that you revisit gambling in Oregon and offer to the state of Oregon about a year from now some really vital information that will allow the legislature and those of us as citizens to make a better decision in the year 2000 than we did in 1984. Thank you.
Well, to start the questioning, because we have four speakers and it'll be a little bit awkward to ask each of the four to answer each of the questions, I'm going to uh, direct my first question to Chris Lyons. And then if anyone else has a response to it, I'd like to do it. But Chris, obviously, um, you're in the position of having to defend um, the lottery and its objectives. And I want to keep you defending it for a moment. Um, can you, you characterize as a myth the issue of whether or not the lottery, the lottery um, preys on the poor and uneducated. Um, can you tell us um, specifically how does the lottery define its goals for advertising and how does the lottery measure the success of its advertising? The, um, am I on here? I think I am not here myself. Uh, the, um, the issue of advertising for the lottery is, is uh, this is a question I'm often asked. Um, the lottery uh, obviously advertises and uh, our players, we, this is a business for us and so uh, we, uh, because of our responsibilities to raise revenue uh, and in responding to our players who want to know about prizes and games, we get that information out to them in the same way any business would. Uh, we, we try to focus those ads uh, in a way that they are fun and entertaining. Uh, we, <clears throat> uh, we focus uh, uh, our efforts there. We try not to um, make wild promises or, or entice people through those ads. But if uh, we've been successful, if, if at the end of the ad you giggle, sometimes <clears throat> people groan. Uh, but most often they giggle. Uh, we do do a, um, <clears throat> a baseline uh, annually, and, uh, and through that we ask Oregonians lots and lots of questions. And, and really, we ask them if they see our ads. And uh, we really um, uh, are more interested in uh, putting those ads uh, out there, making the information available through our advertising, but we don't <clears throat> measure in any concrete way whether or not those ads have been successful in generating X dollars worth of sales, if that was uh, the point you were leading to. Uh, we advertise our games, as Ellen indicated. We've also make a, uh, a very large investment uh, in ads um, focusing on the issue of problem gambling and getting that message out not only to folks who have difficulties but also to their families. And the other area where we spend advertising dollars is uh, on a series of ads called the Oregon Wins. Um, the other thing that has been asked of us by our players is tell us where the money goes and how it's being uh, invested. So we spend money in all of all three of those areas. And as you know, we do not uh, uh, advertise uh, video poker in any way. Ralph City Club. Is this on? Yes, it is. Uh, again, right in line with this question of advertising, we've corresponded about the issue of using the images of children and adolescents in your advertising. And I would like to understand why that would persist in billboards and on TV, that we would see the smiling children and their computers. And this is not part of what we see from any of the casinos. And we also know that adolescents are three times more vulnerable to addiction than adults. Basically, is there a policy that's creating a downstream marketplace for the lottery in young adults? To answer your question directly, there is no policy. We work uh, very hard. Um, you know, people over 18 are, are allowed to play, but we really work on focusing on um, and directing our advertising uh, to folks who are over 21, and that has been a policy of of mine since since I've come to the lottery. Um, the when you see uh, a child in an ad, and we really don't do that very often. Uh, it really is focused on education and the outcome, and we you know. Every once in a while, we, um, we create an ad that doesn't work. And we do try to run those ads through focus groups. And if we run an ad that is troublesome, and we had a billboard last year that uh, we got some negative uh, reaction to, we took that down immediately. And so we, all, we sometimes um, don't get it right. And when we don't, 
uh, we recognized that immediately and we, we moved to fix it. Advertising is, is very subjective and we work very hard um, to, uh, to not only be tasteful but to get the information out in a pretty straightforward way. I'd like to comment on that, sure. if I may, in the last legislative session. We did testify on advertising for the lottery, and we acknowledged there was a need, perhaps, to introduce a game or to give some information about the game. But we suggested that maybe the guilt business ought to be ours, and that um, those Oregon Win ads, which really say that if you care about agriculture, if you care about children's education, if you care about research and higher ed, then perhaps you ought to be playing the lottery. And um, we found those most offensive. Your reference to youth, it's one of the things we're going to be looking at from the foundation in, in our youth study, is asking some questions about what brings young people, and more and more young people are participating in gambling, what brings them to look at it as something that is culturally, socially acceptable behavior. And um, so we will be looking at advertising there. Hello, I'm uh, Gregory Kafuri. I'm a Portland lawyer. Uh, if there are people who are interested in actually doing something about what we're discussing, there will be an initiative filed in the next month or so against uh, uh, video poker and you can contact me for it. Um, I'd like to ask Ms. Lyons, so, since you wanted a lot of questions. Um, a friend of mine is a, a, a teacher out in East County, and uh, you know, poor white kids. And she says that uh, when she asked the uh, children, grade school children, about being a success in life, they all knew what that meant, and they waved their hands, and they said, being a success means winning the lottery. How do you feel about that? Well, I, I would um, hope that people don't equate success with winning the lottery. You know, I, I think um, in the real world, people really recognize that, um, you know, gambling, playing the lottery, is frankly more about losing than winning. And um, I think that's a, an educational issue. Um, that that we need to make sure that people really understand what gambling is about. People have gambled forever. Um, it's uh, I think sometimes it's a, a part of human nature. Um, I don't really expect it to go away, but I think we ought to look at it realistically. It is a chance. I would um, uh, if if that youngster said that to me, um, I would explain to that youngster the facts. Uh, which is the, w the way to be a success is to uh, work hard and get an education and go to school and to be basically a good and decent person and it has absolutely nothing to do with playing the lottery. Ed Borowski, City Club. Uh, I'm a mathematician, statistician, uh, computer scientist. Uh, I lived in Las Vegas for nine years and uh, my question's for Ellen Lowe. Uh, I'm in favor of eliminating the Oregon lottery. Where do I join? <laughs> I think a number of places. Um, one certainly would be to participate with your faith community um, and ecumenical ministries of Oregon to be supportive of uh, the Oregon Gambling Addiction Treatment Foundation. Uh, Greg Kafori just indicated that he is uh, contemplating an initiative, and I don't know if it's for 98 or the year 2000. 2000. For, the, for the year 2000. And um, I know that um, talking about gambling, um, uh, some of us don't like to take risks, and perhaps that's why we didn't proceed in 98. But by the year 2000, we'll have good information, particularly if the City Club does a report. Uh, Gil Johnson, member. Um, I voted for the uh, lottery in 84, I remember. I bought the line. Uh, 